everyone, we are coming to you live from Newegg Studios in Southern California. This is Newegg Now. I'm Trisha Hirschberger. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell. We're here live every Thursday, 10 a.m. Pacific time, bringing you the gift of news, interviews, and limited time deals on the tech you love. You can watch along on Newegg's Facebook or YouTube pages, but the best place to be, the place to be, newegg.com slash Newegg Now, because that's where you'll find all of today's deals. Special Newegg Now deals begin right at the start of the show each week and stay active while supplies last through the end of the day. So if you're watching this episode anytime after Thursday, August 16th, 2018, then while we appreciate it and we'll make sure that you have lots of fun, we promise. you will have missed your chance to save on all of today's deals. Totally. But fear not, just remember to mark your calendar for Thursday, 10 a.m. <laughs> Pacific time, because we'll keep coming back with more deals. It's almost a threat. So <laughs> this is our 38th episode now, and I don't see any signs of us slowing down. No, man, we're that. doing it. We're doing it. Uh, so let's start things off with a look at a couple of those new Egg Now deals that yeah. we're teasing you with, uh, starting with the Corsair Hydro Series H150i Pro RGB Liquid CPU Cooler. This is one of the coolest coolers around. <laughs> with dynamic multicolor <laughs> RGB lighting, magnetic levitation fans, mm -hmm. and precise pump control to let you balance performance and noise. The H150i is $20 off today, only as a part of Newegg Now. Yeah, and so uh, there's also the ASUS 27-inch MG 279Q monitor, a free sync champ with 144 hertz refresh rate and 2K resolution. That's $50 off today through Newegg Now. And it's a great choice if you're looking for a display that takes gaming seriously. So on today's episode, we're going to take a deeper dive into AMD's second generation Threadripper CPU after we unboxed it live last week on the show. We're also going to be talking about retro gaming and retro PC builds and peripherals. And then we'll wrap things up by playing a little bit of the Mega Man X Legacy Collection. Sounds like fun, right? Very, I'm, I'm very excited about this. Yes. Some Mega Man action. I, I haven't played Mega Man in a while. So what could you possibly want more of out of a I show? I don't know. I feel like we cover all the bases. I think it's kind of a big deal. But before we get to Threadripper, um, we do need to talk. We should take a second uh, talk about the news out of QuakeCon this Ooh, week. Yes. And the gameplay reveal for Doom Eternal. Yes. And uh, Trisha, I know you are all about the combination of first-person shooter and horror. You know, aspects, those are both my favorite your top things. Two things. No, but seriously, <laughs> I mean, like, because um, this this has been kind of fun. I mean, like last week we talked a little bit about the uh, the gameplay footage from Red Dead. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What did, what did you think about the the Doom reveal? Um, so we actually have some footage that I think we can roll. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it looks really similar to Doom 2016, which I, a lot of people were super super into. Um, yeah. The new weapons look really cool. Uh, there's like a wrist-mounted blade for slashing enemies, and um, I love that the demons are destructible. I don't that know if you saw really like cool. the graphic breakdown of that. Um, it'll probably be hard to notice with all the chaos going on in the game. Get it, graphic breakdown? Because it's uh, also like graphic violence and then graphics. I get it. <laughs> Hashtag dad jokes. Um, no, but it, it does look really cool, and I really like that. What did you think of it, Juan? Uh, yeah, this is right up my alley. Again, run and gun, crazy, mayhem, bloody destructive <laughs> horror elements but just you know all action this is this is what doom should look like and i'm stoked to see that this is a franchise that i grew up with as a little kid like one of my first father son gaming experiences oh. was getting to play doom on a computer in his computer lab on on base uh, and like this is a franchise that still kind of offers up some fun uh you know gory hellish uh, gameplay. Probably not something I'm going to throw Lex into right away. Maybe not. I'm gonna, Although... I'm going to pump the brakes on that and wait just a bit. OG so. Doom was the game that got me into uh, figuring out how to take apart a PC. Okay. Because uh, I needed four whole megabytes of RAM to run this game. And our computer at home did not have it. That's and so I was awesome. like, well, how do I get more of this thing called RAM? And my parents had no idea, so I was left on my own to figure it out. Like, um, but that's what started it all. Even though the original Doom scared the living oh, yeah. Jesus out oh, of me. Oh, so good. I mean, and you know, back then you couldn't just download more RAM. So you actually had to learn how to like. Oh yeah, no, box. no downloading more RAM. I, actually, one of the things that I think is kind of interesting. Um, how do you think you would feel about maybe being a demon in Doom? Yeah, you can do that now. Isn't that kind of cool? That's very cool. It's so you can uh, be a demon in another person's game. Right. Similar to the Phantoms in Dark Souls. I, it's very cool. I really want to see some more, like, like I would love to also see that hit a franchise like Alien vs. Predator. Yeah, oh my god. You know, like where you could be you like a little be alien. A yeah, you could be a xenomorph in someone else's <laughs> like Predator game. I think that would be, uh, that would be epic. But like Doom, again, 
absolutely the right place with this world we're in with lots of uh, like these open world destiny style things where you mm -hmm. are a part of someone else's mission or gameplay even if you're not really working on the same thing at the same time yeah I like the idea of also being the bad guy of course you do because that. you love horror games so of course so you would want to creep in my game and scare so the poop good. out of me um, <laughs> <laughs> Let me know when you're streaming and I'll jump in. Okay, sounds great. great. Um, but like seeing the Doom Slayer or Doom Guy or the Doom Marine or whatever you want to call him back in action in this footage is really exciting and it certainly got the crew here at Newegg Studios yeah, a lot of chatter. debating where he ranks in terms of all-time toughest video game heroes. So Newegg's Game Crate posted a poll question on Twitter about it based on a Reddit thread from a user called Shark Lord Satan asking the question, who would win in a fight between the Doom Slayer and Kratos from God of War? Um, on that Twitter poll, 60% of respondents said that Kratos would take the fight. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think, Juan? Are people giving the Doom Slayer the respect he deserves? So, I I think that I think that breakdown is is appropriate. Like, okay. Like a 40% camp of people for voting Doom for Slayer. the Doom Slayer. That actually does pretty good because on the surface you'd be like, well, Kratos is like a war god. Yeah, I, uh, I actually so. went down the Reddit thread rabbit hole on oh, this one. I, I didn't and dig there too deep. are people so adamantly in one camp or another. It was <laughs> fascinating for me to read. I mean, people arguing that Kratos is faster, stronger, more durable. He's killed bigger things than Doomslayer has. Um, and then other people that are like, uh, Kratos takes damage from a crappy little arrow wound. If he was shot, like, how, what would bullets do to him? Let and alone a BFG. R right? right, and then Doomslayer advocates talking about the BFG, ranged weapons, bullets, um, and reminding people that like Doomslayer was the one who caused the devil to hide in the seventh circle of hell. Like it, it got very heated. I loved I, it. I kind of feel like we would also need to. You can't really answer this debate unless you also talk about the arena in which they fight. Because if Doomslayer has to fight Kratos on Kratos' yes. home turf then he doesn't have all of his armor and right. weapons Our and weapons stuff like allowed. that. Right, so Yeah, exactly. It's, a little, a, it's a little of... Batman versus Superman, yep. right? You mm -hmm. know, like if uh, Batman has time to prepare, obviously Except for Batman. Superman always wins in Superman versus wow. Batman. But... Okay, this is good. we need to save that for a whole <laughs> extra episode. Um, if you're out there watching and you want to be a part of that conversation, <laughs> Maybe not necessarily the Batman v Superman conversation, but you can sound off in the I chat. I have strong opinions about that one. I, I believe I do too. I think Ooh. we'll have some some uh, fun okay. debate that we'll have to plan. Again, we'll save that. We'll table that. <laughs> uh, sound off in the chat. You can hit YouTube or Facebook where the show's streaming. Uh, we want to know what you think about this or anything else we talk mm -hmm. about today. We will be checking in on that conversation later on in today's show. So, uh, you know, definitely uh, drop us some comments. Yes, stay right where you are because coming up next, we've got a special guest in the house to talk all about AMD's newest Threadripper CPU. Power. I almost missed the cue coming back because we were still debating Batman v Superman. That's all right. To be continued. Please, please continue. Uh, if you missed last week's episode, <laughs> then you missed Juan and I unboxing the new second generation Threadripper CPU from AMD. Uh, it was just unveiled to the public last week, but it yeah. wasn't until this week that the embargo lifted on benchmarks and real hard numbers for this new processor. Yeah. And the early results have been very impressive. So here today to talk to us about AMD Threadripper and the high-end CPU wars, we have AMD's James Pryor. Welcome, James. Thank you, guys. Yay. Thanks for joining us. So uh, to, to kick things off, uh, can you just tell us what do you do at AMD? What's your job title? For sure. So I have a, probably a pretty cool title. I'm a product manager for the client enthusiast team. So nice. I get to build the really cool stuff that we see in the market day, Ryzen, Threadripper, that kind of stuff. I do a little bit of biz dev, a little bit of spokesperson duty, showing up places like this. Thank you so much for having me. And also working on product definition, product strategy. So a very broad role. And awesome. is, like enthusiast is in the name. Right. So yes. you're enthusiastic about yeah. getting yeah. to play with these toys. Yes, enthusiastic about <laughs> it, building enthusiast products like Threadripper. Nice. Uh, so before we get into the nitty-gritty of second-gen Threadripper, can you talk a little bit about 
how we got here. What should people know about the original Threadripper and specifically who came up with that really cool name? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Now, so Threadripper was a, a skunkworks project. It wasn't originally on our roadmap. Actually, me and a couple of other guys um, put together a, a concept. We, we saw the great technology that was coming and figured out a way to say, you know, we've got this, this beautiful market opportunity, this beautiful product we can do. Let's just go do it. So we worked on it in the evenings, weekends, spare time, clandestine phone calls when we were supposed to be working on other things. And fortunately, because our boss, Jim Anderson, is a huge CPU enthusiast fan as well, he loved it. He greenlit it. And we were st was, the name came from when we were uh, doing the ideation and the thinking around Ryzen. We're thinking, oh, what are we going to call Ryzen? We had a whole bunch of names. We've got this world-class agency we were working with, giving us some suggestions, and Threadripper was in there. And, and Jim said, Threadripper, I know exactly where to use <laughs> that. that. This, is, this, is our, this is our big guy. This is our monster product. So we're going to use that for that. That was, boom, that was it right there and then. That's how that moment came to be. So for first gen, you remember, it seems like so long ago, but it was actually just a year, yeah. 20 years ago, transforming HEDT, high performance for enthusiasts, whatever else. And you know, 16 cores, people were telling us, what are we going to do with 16 cores? Reddit was like, this is stupid. We don't want 16 cores. No one needs Well, it did seem to kind of take a, a good chunk of, especially the enthusiast PC builder base, not by surprise, but right. it was a little unexpected to yeah. see that come out, coming out of AMD's camp. Totally, totally. I mean, the market was used to this incremental. You, you spent, you know, you got an eight core for $1,000, then you got two more cores for another $800. Yeah. It was mm -hmm. very steep ramp on your, on your performance there, and we just blew that up, the Ryzen effect, right? We did it at Ryzen 3, 5, and 7. We did it at Threadripper, and we did it on purpose because we're redefining the market. We're defining what we think is the right level of multi-thread performance for the future. We led with 64-bit computing. We led right. with low-level APIs, with DirectX 12, Vulkan. Well, and early to the market for things like multi-core computing. Exactly, like early to the market with that. So it's, it's in our history, it's in our heritage, and it's how we're going to attack the marketplace and deliver value. So we're going to be incredibly competitive in gaming, in streaming, in multi-thread applications. We're going to dominate. You now you've got the world's fastest desktop processor. Unquestionably, irrevocably, <laughs> you're not going to beat this this year. So what sets Threadripper apart from the main Ryzen line? Um, really, there's two things. Number one is this massive multi-threaded capability. And number two is the platform. It's really designed for enthusiasts, by enthusiasts. Like, so we put all the PCIe lanes in there, 64 PCIe lanes, all the cores, it's all unlocked. There's no natural defeaturing, right? So we don't say, well, the top guy, you get more lanes than the bottom guy. So you've got to figure out which parts are dark on the motherboard and right. it's complicated. Maybe you need to put a sticker. None of that, right? Everybody gets the same amount. You're just buying up for more performance. Cool. Simple, easy, clear. You can see how if you're looking for a price point, you can build performance. If you're looking for the best, you can get that too. So it came from that, that genesis of we want it to be simple and easy, but it's going to be something that people who are gamers, enthusiasts, overclockers, tweakers, tuners, performance enthusiasts can get excited about and say, you know, this scales to everything I want. It's more than I want today, but I can see myself in a year or maybe two hitting the limits, and I want to be able to buy today with that future proofing in mind. Now, because the, the, you were saying the initial response to the first Red Ripper was a bit quizzical or yeah. a bit skeptical. Um, it seems to have succeeded enough for AMD oh, yeah. to be expanding that product line. Now into the second gen, um, what's available you know, to launch, and then what, how will this line uh, expand? For sure. This year. Well, we, if, if I think back to how we created this product, we always planned on 32 cores, but we needed to wait for the technology to cap up to our ideas and our, mm -hmm. and our vision. So first gen, we did 16 cores, 12 cores, eight cores. That was our X series of products. And we replaced that then with two different market segments now. We came back and replaced the X series. That's coming out at the end of the month with our 16 core 2950X. And that will be on the 31st. But right now, today, this week, we launched the 2990WX. And WX is our very clear signal to the market. We're looking at you workstation buyers. We're looking at you guys that are blending and <laughs> rendering and you know, photogrammetry and you're building stuff in Maya. You know what right. Arnold is. You understand the concept of batching 200 videos through Handbrake yes. and then still needing <laughs> to be able to use your PC <laughs> While it's doing for design that, yeah. and modeling and everything else. You're a massively mega tasking guy. If that's you, then you know you already want this. This yeah. is your product. 
You know, if you're sitting out there going, Fortnite, hmm, 32 <laughs> cores. No, no, no. Stay, Ryzen 7, Ryzen 5, those right. are your products for you. We build a product for everyone, but not every product is for everyone. everyone. Sure. So we, we segment based on pricing, based on our marketing, based on our performance. So that WX is really coming out strong and hard to take over the kind of the guys that are DIYers that love cores and threads for the sake of it, yeah. but really focused on professionals. The guys that are buying from a local boutique builder, maybe one or three or five PCs, because it's just a group of them that work together, but they do world-class work. They do movie quality visual effects. They do yeah. the highest quality render outs. They worry about things like subsurface light scattering right. on 10,000 different light sources. Yeah. That's a conversation they have every day. If that's you, WX is your CPU. If that's not you, maybe look a little bit low down the stack, the X series, because that balance of gaming, being able to stream, being able to have other things and background apps going on. If you're thinking about three monitors, high resolution gaming, the best twi Twitch stream experience that you can get, plus the ability to manage that chat and everything else all in one box, that's a Threadripper X processor right there. We, we, we had a, c a few questions from our audience about yeah. some of those things. It, it was our assertion. I mean, like we were taking an, a hypothesis on that, that if it was just the pure gaming box, that maybe Threadripper probably wasn't the right fit for that kind of an individual. But you're gonna get a great gaming experience out sure. of it, but if that's all you're gonna do is game, you're probably overbuying a little bit. You okay. should come down in price segment, save yourself some money, put it into your Steam library or whatever else, you know. Save it for the games. Save your money for your games. Go for the Ryzen 5 or Ryzen 7, and those are gonna deliver the same great gaming experience you see from the competitor products, but still have that multi-thread advantage. So if you're more casual, occasionally you might think about in the future dabbling in streaming, or right now you're just worried about, I need to be able to do my homework, I need to be able to do <laughs> right. my finances, I wanna get my photos for grandma ready to put them on OneDrive so she can screenshot them, whatever it is, right? Then that's the Ryzen 5 and Ryzen 7 buyer. The X series in Threadripper, you already know that you're gonna sit there and, and recode movies and you're gonna transcode and, and do an export out of Premiere Pro or DaVinci Resolve. Right. You know, that you do massive amounts of, of throughput and bandwidth and those kind of things. So confirmed, the W is for workstation? Absolutely, 100%. Stamped right here. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Woo! Nailed it. Um, okay, and uh, <laughs> the new, the second gen Threadripper, the new CPU works with existing AMD motherboards, correct? That's correct. Yeah. We. Um, we built in a lot of headroom for our platform definition so that we could scale into the 32 cores. Cool. So all of the current motherboards out there, X399, work with the 32 core out of the box. You need a BIOS update. Fortunately, these all of these motherboards have really cool USB updating technology. So you just put a specially named file into the port, mash a button, and it updates. Nice. Cool. This couldn't be easier. It's very cool technology, and they've all done that. Now, if you're looking at overclocking, you might want to look at a couple of the newer boards that are out there, like the MSI MEG Creation or the Gigabyte Aorus Extreme. Mm -hmm. Those things have massive amounts of VRMs, so you can really get the power into the CPU, okay. get the super overclocks. That's what you're going to need if you're, if you're a liquid nitrogen overclocker and you're like, I want the 32-core <laughs> world record, and you want this guy, <laughs> those are the boards to go after. I, I don't Woo! want So is, is that you guys? You, you play around with the liquid? No? Oh, yeah, no, yeah, not, totally. I'm no. like, every day. No. <laughs> I not even, can't even joke. Nope. <laughs> I'm yeah, not, we, I'm not we don't that play cool. with it. We don't play in that uh, playground. No. So um, we've been talking <laughs> a lot about cores and threads. Uh, the conversation around Threadripper. Can you break that down for us a little? Like the difference between a core, how you separate out yeah. work threads in there, and why would this matter? Why why are we taking this approach with Threadripper? For sure. So you know we've we've come from this era of single core one one piece of silicon to do the processing, and we've been trying to scale out sideways because the vertical scaling, which is frequency yeah. and just throughput on that core, just went away a long, long time ago, mm -hmm. decades ago. So multi-core has always been away. And then uh, simultaneous multi-threading, SMT for short, the threading is just a technique so that you can schedule in the hardware two sets of instructions to go through because one instruction may not process in one clock tick it may take multiple clock ticks, and it may be waiting on something else to happen in memory or a fetch or something, and there's you know that big long wait or delay, and then the CPU's just sitting there going, okay, what do I do? Mm -hmm. Well, you've got more instructions lined up and ready to go, so it context switches between different instructions, manipulating lots of data, and that's one of the things we put into Threadripper and Ryzen was not only SMT, but also um, an incredible uh, neural net in the front end. It's, it's true AI in the front end of our CPU 
but it's understanding the workflow that's coming, looking at the instructions, and then saying, oh, okay, here's where I can schedule, here's where I can make sure the data is ready to reduce that weight from memory access times. Right. And we have a smart prefetch cache. You've got 80 megabytes, right? You were talking about needing four megabytes for Doom. You've got 80 <laughs> megabytes. Four megabytes of RAM, <laughs> let alone prefetch. 80 megabytes of cache <laughs> in this guy right here, and it's specifically designed to bring in the data for the instructions as fast as possible to make it sure you get the most amount of throughput on those cores. So that really helps you with massively multi-threaded applications. Now gaming tends to be very single thread because it's all about a race to do the next frame. You're talking in right. 13 or 10 milliseconds to get all your processing done and you've got to respond to a controller input, netcode update, but video encoding, now you're talking about this big, huge frame and then they're changing every 24 so, you know, times a second, and there's differences in there. You can break that up into parallel workloads, scale it across cores. And then the higher quality you're looking at for your encoding, the more operations you're trying to do, like throwing a warp stabilizer on there to get rid of the shaky cam, yeah. that's going to benefit with more cores and threads, and that's why you want a thread ripper for your content creation. So AMD really is looking at this for the set of people who are going to be into uh, edi video editing as Adobe Premiere, AutoCAD, Handbrake, stuff Handbrake, like that. Handbrake, yeah. What, what what was AMD's relationship with some of those? I have to imagine you had conversations with people at Adobe yeah. oh, about, sure. about what to do with this because we don't want to be too far out of that software hardware <laughs> pendulum swing. Right, right. Like, yeah. it, it seems like we, we get a couple generations ahead in one area, then our hardware struggles to, to really do you know, like the 4K video, 8K mm -hmm. video, 360 video. Yes. Then the hardware screams forward, and then we're kind of waiting on is the software really taking advantage? of all of that. What was that relationship like with some of these these developers? Yeah, like, I'm, I'm sure the response has been positive. Oh, yeah. Are they really looking at how can they extract all of Threadripper to make Premiere, AutoCAD, Handbrake more, more functional? Definitely, absolutely. We've sampled thousands of PCs to developers with Ryzen and Ryzen Threadripper inside of them. They're all looking to update to take advantage of the new architecture, the Zen Core, the new memory layouts that we offer, the benefits of our type of technology, um, the SMT that we offer, the Smart Prefetch Cache. It takes time, especially when you've got something like uh, Adobe. It's a massively popular product, yeah. and users of massively popular products hate to be beta testers. So you don't want to push something on them, right? right? And yeah. then you know, and then Adobe are also looking at how many people they've got asking them for it. So we take definitely taking the build it and they shall come approach. We're going to redefine the market. We're going to drive the processor sales, the awareness, the mind share around multi-threading, which is already happening. Our yeah. competitors doing the same thing. They're going the same way. So it's all of us pushing in the same direction. So the updates are going to happen. They will happen over time. There are different other applications. You can try um, DaVinci Resolve, already has beautiful scaling. Um, Premiere yeah. Pro, if you look at, it depends on your workload too, right? If you're taking a 1080p video and trying to put it to 720p for your phone, <laughs> you spend more time as an application trying to schedule that and break that up into chunks than you do actually processing the chunks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you end up running out of time. It's called Amdahl's Law. But if you go to 4K video or 8K video, right, content that's broadcast quality, then you start to see the massive effect that 32 cores has because now you're putting the hardware where the workload matches up. Nice. And that's why we're talking about this for workstation professionals because they're buying, you know, three, four, five thousand dollar PCs, which just seems insane. But their application license is multiples of that yeah. and their jobs that they're working on are multiples of that mm -hmm. so it's really a very small cost in comparison and the, what they care about is that day that moment time to completion which is fastest <laughs> right. and it's rising thread and, and literally yeah. every single second is yeah. costing it's them. money yeah it's absolutely it's it's you know it gives them more time to do more things right i had the opportunity to go to italy recently and see michelangelo's david it's a beautiful statue massive i did no idea that it was four times life size but you can walk into this museum for 10 euros and see the chunks of marble and granite, or whatever else that he started working on other versions and stuff. And they're like a third finished or half finished. And I just had this like this epiphany. I'm like, oh, well, of course he made more than one. Why would he, why would he just do one concept? <laughs> no, this one was perfect. He did just one thing in his head. So, you know, like the, the digital Michelangelo's today yeah. are using multiple models. They're making multiple approaches. Even, you know, when you go to a creative agency, they don't give you one concept. They give you a dozen. And you yeah. pick from that and refine. Mm -hmm. And each time you give them more processing power, they give you better quality results. They give it to you faster. And that's the change you're going to see when you have Ryzen Threadripper as part of your workflow.
I like that analogy. That's super cool. Uh, so as the senior product manager, you're probably the best person to ask this question. Why is the new Threadripper so big? Like physically, why is it so big? We were, we were well, commenting on you know, like the whole, my palm. Yes, it's a, it's a massive chip. It weighs about as much as an iPhone 5, which is a fantastic thing. It led to our tagline of create with heavy metal because it's <laughs> you know, just weighty. Yeah. So the reason why it came about is our design process. We are very modular. So inside of every Threadripper is top 5% of our Ryzen product. Okay. So the, every Ryzen is born hoping to be a Threadripper. 5% graduate. That's, that's, wow. that's all you get. Okay. So wow. that's the top bin. If you're an overclocker, you should be thinking, hey, man, I'm going to get better clocking results. Yes, okay. you will. This is where you'll find all the right. best bin CPUs. Um, it, it, because we, we, you know, there's the, the meme on Reddit, we glued them together. Yep, infinity fabric glue <laughs> all over the interposer. Drop two chips in there. Call it the X series. That's our 12 and our 16 core. We put four chips in there for our 32 core. So you've got four Ryzen's working together in synchronously, and they're just giving the full performance. You know, the tons of bandwidth between the chips. We've got the, you know, each chip talks to each other at a 50 gigabit per second link. So you've got an aggregate of 150 gigabytes per second of data moving around inside this monstrous chip. Tons of performance, tons of power, and it needed a box to commensurate <laughs> that with it, right? right? You know, we heard a lot of feedback from our partners that they're like, you know, I don't want, if I'm spending this kind of money, I don't want something it's gotta be an experience. that looks yeah. the same as your $50 product. Yeah, so I want, right. I want something that's an experience that <laughs> redefines what I should be buying. And it was fantastic when we launched the first gen Threadripper, beautiful box. We were sending these to our system builder partners and they were calling us and saying, hey, can you, can you change my order from just the bare CPU to the product box runs? <laughs> Why? I want to put that on the shelf, them? right? <laughs> well, the customers were calling them and saying, I want a Threadripper PC, but make sure you send me the box it came in because I want that for my shelf. Yep. This is, you know, that's beautiful. Yeah. I've seen so many YouTube videos with those just sort right? of casually in the Just in casually the, in the right. background, on sitting the off to the right side. Here. It's nice packaging. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I haven't tried it myself, but I kind of feel like you could replace the chip itself with a five by seven of your family. I don't know if it's a frame <laughs> for your photos now. <laughs> I'm, I, just saying, I'm just saying. I don't I, know. I, if, if I can <laughs> offer any suggestions, I feel like the box has a disturbing lack of RGB. <laughs> so like if, if, my, if, if my chair is going to match my keyboard, I kind of feel like my display Threadripper box. We looked it long also. and hard at RGB for the box, and you know, it's that pesky shipping regulation of batteries you know, yeah. going across the globe. I'm sure AMD it was, it was, can find a solution. It was very, very close, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> you know, one of the cool things we did with this box is you can see right through it, and it's got these orange pieces in it. When you hold it up to any kind of Andean light, it kind of glows by yeah, itself. It That's cool. So we tried it's to build a little bit go. of light diffusion into there. So I just, I'll do about, an orange build. Right, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, practical um. effects RGB, you know. Um, so maybe this is a bizarre question, but we have to ask. So then what are the chances that the next generation of Threadripper CPUs are going to be even bigger? Like, are we approaching a future where we get something the size of like a Pop-Tart? <laughs> Yeah, we're kind of looking at the next level of concept now. We were thinking more 3D, so rather than a single pop tart, okay. the 48 pack box, Got you it. know, going for bigger size like that. So, <laughs> no, we're going to try like and. a cube? In yeah, the, yeah. yeah. the hypercube process is coming it. next. It's going to glow, it's by itself. <laughs> I don't know. It's, we, we're going to try and keep compatibility. We're going to try and keep uh, scalability because it's important for this market. People want that future proofness, they yeah. want that consistency. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's. it's I think it's plenty big enough until someone else comes along and takes the crown and says, no, my, my CPU is bigger than yours, then I think we'll leave it alone. <laughs> okay. That, I think that's perfectly fine. <laughs> um, so the embargo for benchmarks. Because we, 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 we had a little chat before we yep. jumped into the show, just talking numbers. And sometimes there's some controversy when we get into numbers. Um, sure. So we saw a ton of videos and articles from like PC World Gizmodo. Um, I'm sure you've, you've, you've been keeping abreast, watching what people have been saying. Uh, what can you tell us in general about the, the sort of the public numbers that you're seeing off of the systems that people are testing Threadripper in? Yeah. And how that cor corresponds? Because I'm sure AMD had their own set of mm -hmm. um, goals that they were yeah. trying to achieve with Threadripper. Yeah, for sure. So the overall, we're very pleased with what people are saying and seeing with the Threadripper process. It lines up to our expectations. Um, I love how the conversation is moving away from, let's see one application that uses 32 cores to let's look at a workflow. Okay. Let's look at someone who's really using the whole PC and how does 32 cores change their life? 
that time to completion race, the ability to still be modeling or producing photogrammetry models while you're doing a render on a different project, while you're doing an encode for YouTube and then another encode for a different social platform. Because you've got different, you know, people don't know when you encode for YouTube, it's different than when you yeah. encode for somewhere else. You have to do it twice, it's not the same video. And that, that's all something that goes on in the heads of creators, the, the casual guy that's looking on the outside going, I'm attracted by the high core count and the massive performance, but I don't know if I can use it. So yeah. it's very nice to see that. There's obviously the differences between different OSs driving some conversation there. We're a very close partner with Microsoft. We'll have updates to help take advantage of the unique nature of this processor. In the meantime, the raw performance of the CPU core delivers dominant multi-thread performance in tons of real-world workloads that really matter to people out there buying today. Yeah. So we're seeing a lot of differences right there. We've got some cool tools in our own software suite like Ryzen Master, lets you disable cores and threads, lets you adjust the frequencies, lets you adjust the memory access mode on the X processors. So you can really tweak and tune this thing far beyond any reasonable yeah. level. So because you know, you've got ultimate control. And that's one of the, the promises we made was you know, ultimate platform with the most PCIe lanes, the most cores and threads, the most multi-threading, and also the most tunability and performance. Uh, led to the creation of my favorite feature, which is pre precision boost overdrive. So this, this <laughs> is just Which is just fun to say. Right, I mean, precision boost <laughs> overdrive, it's a full on metal name, <laughs> had to do it. And what it lets you do is increase your multi-thread performance between 10 and 13% with a click of a button, simply and easily, on top of the 10 to 13% you saw by going to a really good cooling solution. Yeah. So you can see like 20% uplift just by using one of the coolers out there. There's, you know, more than, uh, more than a dozen, probably I think about two dozen right now that are compatible with the WX series, certified by AMD for the 250 watt TDP, like the Corsair H150, that's a great <laughs> product for doing that. So that's a great combo right here by today. But, it's you a good know. Plug. Excellent, it's like, <laughs> yeah, you just you. do the show, it's, it's, it's great. <laughs> but it's, you know, tons of performance that's there if you, if you are thermally advantaged. We didn't define this product based on worst case, thinking about some guy, I don't know, maybe in the middle of the desert, 32C ambient inside his house, which is like, you know, 110 degrees, where you're just like, why would you ever use a 32 core processor in, in that, that environment? But there are people out there, so we have to define our product for that, and then bake in all the headroom for people who live in nice air conditioned houses or have high end cooling and that kind of stuff. So that really led to that creation and, and pulling all that together with Precision Boost Overdrive and extra performance. And it's, it's really fun because now you can get more multi-threaded performance out of a desktop PC with a click of a button than in most 2P servers in market today. Right, so there, there did seem to be, like especially with the launch of the first Threadripper, I, I'm glad you, you brought that back up, the, the notion of disabling cores yeah. or changing that, those performance metrics was one of those difficult concepts to, to kind of talk out, like why would you want to do that? But there were applications which served that kind of usage. If you'll pardon the comparison to a competitor that we had on the show recently where we were talking to Intel about Optane, uh -huh. um, their Optane program. And again, very similar in, in, in sort of trying to accomplish feeding data through a system. Right. That these benchmarks that were created around the time of spinning disk drives and two core <laughs> CPUs aren't really reflective of what people are trying to do on a high-end system these days. Yeah. Um, so you've been finding that the conversation that outlets have been having, we're starting to acknowledge a, a more lifestyle approach to computing, not just this bar graph is bigger than this bar graph mm -hmm. because this one application does this with one core at one time with one thread. Yeah, for sure. We When we first launched the 16 core, there were a few games out there that if you just tried to run them, would just crash the desktop instantly. <laughs> like, no, wow. wouldn't, awesome. Couldn't run. <laughs> and then there were a few that just had, you know, they were pseudo multi-threaded. So they'd mm -hmm. look at the processor and say, how many threads have I got here? 32, great. I'm gonna create a whole bunch of worker threads and use each one that much. So it looked like it was trying to be multi-threaded, but it was right. really just taking a couple of threads worth of work and distributing it and just slowing everything down. In a very inefficient way. So we, we were like, you know, okay, so how do we address this? What can we do? We can work with the developers, obviously natural, yes, check, do that. What's the timeline for that? We're gonna wait for their Q&A, their patches, all that kind of stuff. And then you come back to what can we do now so that the day we launch, we offer a way to improve things. And that's where Ryzen Master came in and our gamer mode versus our creator mode because the best one in the world, why we call this creators, 
creators are gamers too. Yeah. They love to have a little bit of free time, break it down, you know, and everybody's gonna spend eight, nine, 10 hours doing the rendering and then be like, all right, it's time to kick back. Do I really want to change systems, have a whole nother PC for gaming? Right. I just want to game right here, or hey, I know this job's gonna take two hours, but you know, I could do some League or some Dota or some whatever, right? You could jump into PUBG in a little window and just play along, <laughs> have some fun. Right. That's totally a thing that these guys are gonna do. So that's why it gets tested in the media, and that's why we enable different modes so that you can say, okay, here's your level of performance. If you want to raise it up, you can get to here. We've been very fortunate that our performance levels are incredibly high in gaming. It's a beautiful, smooth experience on all of our products. So you're really just chasing the, the benchmark charts rather than an experience difference. If you look at a lot of the, the different uh, titles we have, in our own testing, we saw like a 6% difference in gaming performance from competition to us. We were about 6% back. And that seems to be, everyone's like, you can't admit that. You can't say you're slower in gaming. Right. But that's on average a one and a half millisecond difference in frame time. Who can perceive a millisecond and a half in game while you're enthralled, while you're doing this game? You, unless you're staring at the FPS counter instead of your character, you can't tell well, and you don't know. Especially because the human eye can't see more than 24 frames per second anyway. So it's totally, I, she deserved to hit me for that. She <laughs> probably should have hit me. That was, that was not hard enough of a <laughs> <story>. <laughs> I, I tried, I, it, it's his birthday. I'm yeah. trying to be nice. Um, it's Juan's birthday, by the way, everybody. Nice. Uh, but I feel like we've covered a lot of the big questions <laughs> about this new CPU. Is there anything else that you feel like people should know about the second gen Threadripper? You know, it's the world's fastest desktop processor. Incredibly proud of that title. Um, it's incompatible with all our motherboards. There's a ton of good coolers out there. We have a web page that lists all the cooling solutions. I think just about every one of them is on Newegg, so you can buy them today. All the motherboards are ready to go. Overall, I would say, you know, thank you for being a Ryzen fan to all the guys that they're buying because it's really helping us turn around our business, get back into the mainstream gaming, the high-end segment, and it's incredibly pleasing for us to just less than two years from when we had you know, zero product that you guys were interested in to now be <laughs> fully scaled from 100 bucks to 1800 with the best technology at every price point. Thank you. Nice. And, and so just, just, to, just to be clear, 2990 out now. Yes. Um, 2950 50. comes out at the end of the month. Okay. Uh, the performance results on both are available today. And then in October, we come back October, with the 2970 70. WX, which is our 24 core, 32 mm -hmm. thread product at 12.99. So a very fantastic price point right there. That's gonna cause a lot of disruption and uh, really shake things up again. And then we have our 12 core 2920X coming in at 6.49 on that same day. So we'll nice. come back with the specific details closer to the time. Excellent, awesome. all right. Well, James, thank you so much for, for uh, dropping by to talk to us today. You're welcome. And I, this, I, I have in my script, good luck with the rest of the launch. I think you don't need We'll take it. Uh, no, it seems like it's going well. It's going very well. So, Absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, guys, remember, if you out there watching want to pick up one of these new CPUs yourself, we have that 2990WX on the Newegg.com slash Newegg Now page right now. That's the 2990WX CPU with 32 cores and 64 threads of power. Power. And uh, while you're on that Newegg Now Deals page and itching to shop, why not check out the ASRock Phantom Ooh. Gaming X Radeon RX Vega 56 GPU? Uh, an AMD AMD build. That's $60 off the normal price today only and comes with a special bundle of games that includes Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Ooh, and keeping with our Other AMD times. theme, there are also two ASRock X399 motherboards on that new Egg Now Deals page, both of which will work with your new Threadripper CPU or some more mainstream choices if that's more your speed. The Tai Chi ATX motherboard with super alloy aluminum construction is $50 off the normal price while supplies last, while the Tai Chi Micro ATX board is $40 off. Newegg now has what you need to get your heavy duty AMD build started. So shop on newegg.com slash newegg now. Stay tuned to our show because we're gonna be right back talking about some retro gaming.
all wireframe games like that. My mom still rocks. Like you can, you just like it's like second nature. I'm so jealous. Just that goes your right back. Are gamers. She's like, oh yeah, I can totally school you at this old Atari style game. Oh my you God, suck. I love it. <laughs> it's awesome. It's so great. So uh, we've <laughs> talked about the latest and greatest in CPU tech, but now we're gonna change gears and look to the past. Yes, uh, so we've both been playing video games for decades yep. now, and it's been really cool to see the modern resurgence of more retro titles, both in the way that they're inspiring new games, as well as the new ways to experience the original titles. Oh, definitely. Uh, so we should start by talking about um, the trend of new games that mm -hmm. are inspired uh, using some of these designs of the past. So yeah. we were playing Sonic Mania Plus on the show just a few weeks ago. And it's a perfect example of the marriage of old and new school. It takes everything that worked about, you know, sort of the uh, old school Sonic platformer, uh, but it includes new gameplay, graphics, music, puts it together with uh, better saving and checkpoints, fresh characters, new modes. So it's a great package you can play on a modern mm -hmm. console. When it's done right, that kind of combo, it's really peanut butter jelly time. It's the best of both worlds. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's also been a resurgence of old school titles that attempt to replicate the 8 or 16-bit sensibilities of the 90s while giving more polished gameplay experiences. Shovel Knight is yeah. a great example of this with the pixel art of the 90s and polished modern platforming gameplay with some interesting tweaks. Definitely. Octopath Traveler. On the Switch, I need to get a Switch. I, I need to catch up. Talked about the Traveler so good. Yeah, so that another good uh, recent example. Mm -hmm. A JRPG takes the character sprite style of the 16-bit SNES uh, JRPGs, mm -hmm. pairs it with great-looking landscapes and backgrounds, results in an awesome-looking combo that's great for new players or for gamers who miss the 16-bit RPGs of the Super Nintendo and Genesis eras. Yeah, there's also been a really big emphasis uh, recently in finding new ways to release older games, but for modern consoles. Right. So there are, of course, virtual consoles, which we'll get into in just a bit, but mm -hmm. there's also been a huge push to release physical collections like the Mega Man X Legacy Collection, which we're going to be playing a little bit on later on in today's show. Yeah, I'm stoked about that. So companies like Capcom have been particularly focused on doing this with their franchises like Mega Man and Street Fighter. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did the Street Fighter Anniversary Collection, mm -hmm. another game that we've played here on Newegg now. These collections are a great way to experience older titles because they're official ports. Uh, so you don't have to worry about compatibility or the legality uh -huh. of playing those types of games. Uh, yeah, you know the controls will work perfectly, and often they come with extras like art galleries or character bios. And they also sometimes have newer functionality like save anywhere features or the ability to <laughs> rewind time. And that means you can still play them the way that they were originally designed, but they're also a little bit more accessible to modern gamers. Yeah, so these retro collections are definitely growing in popularity. And it seems like developers are still trying to figure out pricing. Mm. So a Blu-ray disc has enough space to fit the, like the entire collection of a retro console, <laughs> a of like hundreds, yeah. thousands of retro games. But usually they're only shipping with a couple. Mm -hmm. uh, the Mega Man X Legacy Collection is split up into two discs when you could probably fit every Mega Man title ever made onto one. So that being said, it's an incentive for companies to keep re-releasing their older titles. Uh, it's it, In this way, it's relatively cheap, and it gives gamers a good way to re-experience the classics. That seems mostly like a win-win, yeah, I think. Yeah, and the other way to provide access to these older titles is digital releases. Right. This has been fairly common practice for the last few console generations as storage spaces become less of a limitation. Almost all of the major developers and publishers offer digital copies of older games, and lately that's been more or less replacing backwards compatibility. And yeah, so that has pros and cons yes, too. So the pros are that you can get a huge wealth of titles from wherever you are on whatever console you want, and they're officially supported. The downside is you're only allowed to play uh, or purchase games that the publisher decides are worthy of putting out there again. Womp, womp. Yeah, so that's not a problem if you're looking for the really popular first party titles. Like, if you want a Zelda or a Mario, you're not gonna right. be hurting for that. But if you're interested in third party titles, like a GoldenEye, for example, something still pretty popular, you're gonna find it almost impossible to play through any official means unless you still have your N64. And another issue is that even if you manage to find a digital title you do want, it doesn't always feature platform cross compatibility. Nope. So for example, purchases you made on the PSP or PS3 don't always transfer to the PS4 or Vita. So even if you invested heavily in digital versions of PS1 or PS2 games in that generation, you can't use them on your modern console. 
This means that you have to buy digital versions again, which is particularly frustrating if you still own the original. It's all at the discretion of the company that publishes these digital releases, and that can be a real pain in the arse. Yeah, that was a pain point going PS3 to PS4. I had a big library of, I mean, even just like I want to yeah. like jam to some Rocket Knight, you know, like yeah. I just want my platformer, and I can't on my PS4 now. Even though you bought it. Huh, so another option is to simply buy the original titles in consoles. It's not like PlayStation 1s or 2s are super expensive, but of course, not everyone wants to have a bunch of consoles hooked up to their new TV just to play one or two old games. I'd love to have a man cave like wall library of hardware, but yeah. that's just not always going to be feasible. Well, and keeping those old consoles still working yeah. is another issue. That's uh, the very repairs difficult. on that too. So, me also, many older games are becoming significantly more expensive with this yes. nostalgic trend. My, my yes. brother is uh, going back and recollecting a ton of Super Nintendo stuff. Cool. And when he started in college, it was like, oh yeah, this was fun, and I could still get the boxes and the art and the, the booklets. Oh, it's so expensive. If now. you if you have a, a complete like you know, for him, it was when he got the uh, Super Star Wars mm -hmm. trilogy. And like when he got it, it was like it was kind of expensive. It was like thirty or forty bucks per cartridge and the book and the 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 box. Now it's like hundreds and hundreds of dollars Crazy. to find the complete stuff, and it takes some of the fun out of being a collector on that when people are are kind of like pushing that kind of profit side. Yeah, if you don't time. have that disposable income to throw around. Yeah, Not it makes fun. it hard. Uh, Nintendo as a company is particularly focused on eliminating any options other than buying from their Eliminate. digital marketplace, as you've probably been hearing about recently. Yeah. This is absolutely their legal right, but it, it also means that you can't access games other than the ones they decide to release. So this is a little troubling if you want to play third-party titles that Nintendo doesn't see any value in making widely available or maybe can't due to licensing issues. Yeah, so you can see the strategy in action with Nintendo's release of their hugely successful NES Mini <laughs> and SNES Mini consoles. Um, but before we get into you know talking about those delightful little machines, how do you abbreviate Nintendo Entertainment System? Do you say NES or do you say NES? NES. NES, right? Okay. As as a child of the '80s, it's NES, 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 NES Power. It, NES, okay? But, um, I've seen the recent discussions. But but you do say SNES. I say SNES, but I always thought it was like a quirky thing that just I did. Okay. I didn't think that was the way it should be said. I thought I was being funny. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, now that people are saying, well, NES is the way it's actually supposed to be pronounced, GIF, GIF. Uh, then you know, then I'm like, well, now it's not funny anymore. It's now obviously. I just want to say SNES. It's, but it's a Nintendo true. Entertainment System. I don't know. How do you feel about it, Juan? So I've always said NES. I I started saying SNES because of you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, uh, no, I mean I think it's fine. I always used to say SNES, uh, but now I kind of want to start like deabbreviating. Oh, you enjoy your Nintendo Entertainment System Mini console? Like, I want, I want to now like just to like make it super clear and make myself like sound as old as I possibly. Are you playing the Nintendo Entertainment System right now? I love that. No, mom, I'm playing Mega Man. Oh, do you play the Nintendo? And like, I kind of want to. The Nintendo. Wanna, I'm just gonna start calling it the Nintendo from now on. I like it. Um, what do you guys think? <laughs> Let us know your thoughts in the comments on Facebook or YouTube, and we'll get to them a little yeah, bit later. Yeah, send in those the comments. Show. We have, we definitely have some opinions we'd love to kind of dig into <laughs> on some of these strategies, and especially what Nintendo's been doing recently. I think if there's one thing that we are not short of on this show, it's strong opinions. Yes. Uh, Definitely. Regardless of how you Batman pronounce it, Superman. the SNES and Nintendo <laughs> Mini are essentially just Raspberry Pi computers placed inside adorable little cases shaped like the NES and the SNES with reissued controllers. Yeah. Uh, Nintendo gathered their greatest hits and used official emulation to resell them. I mean, it's a pretty neat way to reissue these old classics and allow people to experience them with the aesthetics of the old consoles, but with the convenience of HDMI, save files, and multiple titles all in one tiny accessible box. So rumors are, we like rumors, rumors are that mm -hmm. there could be an N64 mini on the way. Yeah. So, uh, but it would, it would be missing, I think, some of the the glory heyday titles of the N64, yeah. like um, like Goldeneye, I think would be a, a perfect example. Those rare titles. We won't have yeah. Banjo or Perfect Dark. Uh, still, though, there are a lot of other great N64 titles. I mean, first uh, first party Nintendo games, definitely. Yeah. Um, that would be fun to experience again. I think that would definitely be a push uh, in the right direction for N64. I would love it if they do it. Um, but yeah, trying to play old games is an interesting struggle. 
On one hand, it's never been easier to find digital or even physical collections of older titles and to play them on everything from your phone to your PC. <laughs> oh, on the other hand, it's awesome. becoming more and more difficult to find older titles that aren't particularly popular in any official capacity. I like like super rare NES games from back in yeah. the day. Big Nose the Caveman, Trog, like, and that stuff is practically impossible to find. Well, and even some of my favorite, like, they were popular for the time, but they didn't really have franchise potential. Like, yeah. a, like a Blaster Master okay. was a game so far ahead of its time in platforming and in Zelda-style gameplay. It's gone now. Like, wh wh where do you get that game? Like, it doesn't really exist, and we kind of lose sight of that, that our media is a bit more fragile mm -hmm. than I think people expect. Like, a movie, if it's not making money, will just disappear. And you, you won't be able to watch it anymore if there isn't some kind of commerce behind it. Yeah, and we won't, won't be able to get to it legally, you, well, which yeah. we'll talk about in a bit. We'll, we'll talk about it in a bit. But <laughs> there are plenty of ways you can play retro games on consoles. But this is Newegg, mm -hmm. so let's talk PCs. But um, <laughs> Because it takes relatively little power. I mean, you don't even need the 32-core <laughs> Threadripper to run some retro games. You'd be fine with the 1950X. I know. I saw someone comment to... ahead of time when we talked about what we were talking about in today's episode that they were like, you're talking about the Threadripper Red and retro gaming, retro gaming in the same episode? I don't see the fit. The... Separate parts of the show. Separate parts of the show. Yes. There was maybe a harder split there between that. But uh, so we see the SNES, NES Mini. People are doing all sorts of fun stuff with small computers right. like the Raspberry Pi putting together a ton of amazing gaming machines and uh, especially like arcade style cabinets too. Yeah. Do some really fun stuff yeah, there. Yeah, so you don't need a lot of cooling or even a lot of space to run these retro titles, which means that you can fit a tiny little PC in just about everything <laughs> right. from old Game Boys to classic game cartridges. Your imagination really is the limit here, but as far as how to actually get old games to play on your new system, well, it's a tricky legal issue, so you might want to do some of your own research into the rules surrounding emulation. Nicely dodged on our yeah. side right yep. there. So, mm -hmm. uh, all this talk about backwards compatibility, <laughs> licensing concerns, they don't really reply, apply in the same way on PC. They just don't. You, you, you might have to do some homework, some footwork to get really old games running on a modern OS, mm -hmm. but you'll never have to worry about PC titles from last generation not working on your modern system. PC titles from several generations ago still running fine on modern hardware. So while digital, dis digital distribution services like Steam and Origin, I think they raise some interesting questions and concerns about ownership True. Uh, over a game library. For the most part, you'll be able to play PC games you buy today for the long foreseeable future, even as hardware changes. It's a pretty substantial advantage that console players just don't have. I mean, it was the, that was the pain point, PS3 yeah. to PS4. I wanted to be really excited about my PlayStation 4 purchase, but the library of digital games I had was just rendered obsolete and unplayable. Yeah, it's it's probably the main reason why when a new release comes out across all platforms, I will purchase it yeah. to play on PC. I'll purchase it through Definitely. Steam because then I have it. Um, and if you're looking to put together a retro gaming machine, of course huh, are. or a modern gaming machine for that matter, then we've got just about <laughs> everything that you yeah, need. Earlier in the show, we mentioned those two ASRock X399 motherboards. Uh, one of those is even micro ATX. So if you're trying to go small form factor, that could be a really nice option. Yeah, and, and if you're looking for a case, you can check out the Corsair Obsidian 500D on Newegg.com slash Newegg now. The 500D is a beautiful full-size case with premium aluminum and tempered glass, which you can pick up right now for less than $100. Woo! Uh, we've also got some great SSD storage options like the HP EX920 NVMe M.2 that you can pick up in a huge one terabyte capacity Big. with a discount and a gift card that you can use later. Or check out the always popular Samsung <laughs> 970 Evo M.2 in 500 gigabyte capacity for $30 off. And of course, you'll need RAM. You'll need all the RAM. So head over to Newegg now, and you'll be able to get 16 gigabytes of the lovely Corsair Vengeance RGB Pro RAM for $20 off. Or 16 gigabytes, 16 gigabytes, easy for me to say, of the G-Skill Flare X Series 3200 speed RAM for $30 off. We've also got some great power supplies from Corsair, like the 1000 watt HX1000 or the 650 watt Corsair RM650X, both discounted right now. And 
If you're in the market for a pre-built computer, but you want to go super small, definitely take a look at the Zotac Magnus Z-Box EN1060, which you can get for hundreds of dollars off on the Newegnow page mm -hmm. right now. Tiny little machine, has a GTX 1060 in it, probably gave that away just talking about the name of the box. You know. Spoilers. Um, and it's the perfect size for a game console replacement. So if you want portable PC that can play everything from retro games to AAA titles in a case smaller than a cable box, Zotac and Newegg have you covered. So once you have your amazing retro gaming build set up, you might want to check out some of the very awesome retro looking products on Newegg. Gonna These uh, ASIO keyboards, bring it on in, are a great example of old looks coupled with new tech. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you hold that Thank there. Thank you. Cause it's, 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 I mean, it's been getting a lot of reactions here, here in the Newegg offices. Mechanical keyboards, mm -hmm. but as you can see, they've got a very cool typewriter aesthetic. Perfect for those of you looking to make a throwback build out of wood or metal, yeah. or just anyone who wants an eye-catching keyboard. Uh, you can find the one you want by searching for AZIO mm -hmm. on Newegg. Yeah, okay, so we've talked a ton about retro gaming, yeah. and we're just about ready to actually get into some yeah. with the Mega Man X Legacy collection. But uh, before we do, let's go ahead and check in with you guys. Yeah. So, um, we asked you to share your thoughts on NES versus NES, or also just Nintendo in general and digital distribution. Doom Slayer versus Kratos, Threadripper questions, let's see what people have to say. First of all, we've been getting a number of comments saying that our show is not live. Which is the best compliment ever! It means we're doing a good job! Yay, Yay. to the new team that makes this look so beautifully <laughs> produced that people don't believe that we're live. Uh, yay! Okay. And also lots of birthday wishes for one. Oh, you guys! Happy birthday! I'm, I'm all old and decrepit, but yeah. Uh, no way. No, I, I was walking in and kind of making that joke, and uh, New Egg Ninja Keisha was like. You made it another trip around the sun, that's better than the alternative of not making it around the sun again. Fact. So I was like, that made me feel so much better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Keija. <laughs> um, so uh, in in regards to Threadripper, uh, okay. this is from- Some folks on YouTube? I don't know how to pronounce this name. K-I-R-E, Kira? Kira Howard? Oh, I like Kyer? that. Kyer? Mm -hmm. Sorry? Um, uh, so this is in regards who needs a Threadripper is like asking who needs a Titan card from NVIDIA. Many consumers don't need a Titan, but I know many that have them. And I think that's been one of the, um, I think that's been one of the fun tech discussions in general over the last year, is that we're kind of breaking out of this notion of a one size fits all consumer approach mm -hmm. and really doing a better job of delineating the different product segments, you know, yeah. like you've got a Galaxy S9 Plus, but there would be a reason why a Note 9 might make more sense for a specific individual. Absolutely. Not just saying this is the big screen phone that everybody wants. Right, which as a consumer is fantastic yeah. to have those options. And I think the companies are getting a lot smarter about marketing to the specific consumer that is the right person for that product. Without leaving pros behind, like a certain company that makes types of mm -hmm. products that they call their products pros, okay. but yep. they're kind of. Yeah, huh? So just saying. Um. Dustin Walker on YouTube <laughs> says, uh, have you ever thought of the possibility of throwing two Threadripper in a, uh, in a server board? What kind of insane power? That's an interesting idea. Going multi-socket with a crazy yeah. multi-core solution. I, I have to believe. <sighs> no, but I have to believe that there, there are sys admin IT guys right now thinking about what to do with blade servers and yeah. how they can just stack. Um, those kinds of parts on top of each other. I, I'm, I'm sure. Wow. I'm, I am. I guarantee you that on the server side of that, AMD and Intel are looking at how to uh, how to layer those parts up as aggressively as possible. Yeah. I, well, I'd be surprised if people aren't already into it. Yeah. yeah. Like you said. Um, all right. Steve Disrosh on uh, on YouTube says, "I'm happy that AMD start is starting to get mainstream again, Me at too. least CPU wise." Hopefully we're getting the new Radeon that can compete against the 11 series from NVIDIA. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm yeah. super stoked about that too. My first personal build was an AMD Thunderbo uh, Thunderbird. Yay! And so uh, going multi-core, it was all about Athlon. And there's that soft spot in my heart, you know, that nostalgic, like, oh, I love my team AMD builds. I'm on an Intel right now. I still like it too, but we can do okay. I just always think brand competition ends up better for the consumer. Definitely. So I'm, I'm, I'm definitely happy about that as well, Steve. Yeah. So from, uh, from Rurutu M, I always say S-N-E-S, -E and that was immediately followed by Jeff Daniels, who says, I always say 
super N E S. Yep. She so puts uh, the so word people in are, you know, thinking. Uh, people are kind of in agreement, I think, on N E S. And like I said, anytime I said SNES. I thought I was being funny. I was not ever legitimately saying that's how one should pronounce S N E S no, or Super N E S. I do kind of like the SNES, like because it turns a, like a four-syllable collection right. of letters and into so that's the thing. a one-syllable. When you work in the gaming industry, it is just faster to <laughs> abbreviate it, but. Growing up playing the actual classic right. NES, it was the NES. It was the yes. NES. Oh, definitely. Yes. And it had a robot. It was, that was better <laughs> than Atari. Rob the Robot, who I always called Robbie. Atari. Not his real name. No, not his name. I was young. Yeah. But, but Atari didn't have a robot. I think that's why they lost. Well, yeah. I, I'm sure. Uh, so thanks very much to everyone for sharing your thoughts today. We'll be right back with some Mega Man X. And while we get set up, let's check out that trailer. Let's do it. Mega Man X, the spin-off follow-up to the original Mega Man series, debuted in Japan 1993 on the SNES and saw games released on various platforms up to the PlayStation and PC all the way to 2005. So, um, because this this sounds like it was kind of the era where you had already like shifted more into like PC. I had already so. shifted to PC, but I had uh, a lot of experience with the classic Mega Man. NES Mega Man. Yeah, yeah, NES Mega Man. Anything on the NES I know pretty well. Once you get beyond that, I had shifted over to PC. But how about you? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, like, again, it was all about, like, flipping consoles, too. So, mm -hmm. like, my brother was amazing at just, like, well, we want a Super Nintendo. Our parents aren't going to buy us one. We have a ton of NES games. Why don't I just sell everything and buy us the SNES, and then we would move forward okay. that way. And yeah. so, tons, tons. So, I played up hard through Mega Man X3. Awesome. And that's when I started kind of like shifting over into more PC gaming and stuff like that too. Awesome. So, so, so yeah, this what is we, this is a fun homecoming for me. This is perfect for yeah. one. Yay for your birthday! Uh, what we have here is the Mega old. Man X Legacy Collection One, <laughs> which brings together the first four Mega Man X games into one package. So Juan, yes. why don't you start us off? Let's take it for a spin. Okay. Yeah, definitely. So um, first of all, just like a bunch of new game options and modes and stuff. Mm -hmm. I, it looks I, really clean. Oh, and I like these menus too. Mm -hmm. Like the That's thing I mean. also liked about the um, the Street Fighter 
collection was yep. like being able to pick which ones. I don't know, like let's begin at the beginning. Yeah, let's like, do it. Let's let's jump straight into uh, OG old school um, Mega Man X. I'm gonna try and get us around these start up and load screens. Uh, what, one of the things I really like about this is there's a ton of different graphic options. Uh, <laughs> so you can replicate the classic CR. T look if you want. Right. Uh, you can choose your aspect ratio, all manner of different things uh, that you can do with this. There's a huge museum mode to browse art and franchise music, as well as the full anime movie. That's yeah. on here too. Yeah, that I want to check out because I don't think I've ever seen uh, the, the Mega Man. The oh, day of oh, I forgot. We were talking about this before the show. I completely forgot. In my brain, I'd always just sort of thought that Mega Man could, um, uh, could crouch, and he can't. And it's just one of those like old school platformer things you you take for granted. I'm gonna die right there. Um, you take for granted like your character can't duck. <laughs> yeah, that drives me crazy in these games. Uh, yeah, there's um, let's see. Oh, there there is a difficulty setting though. If you're having a hard time, so oh, rookie hunter difficulty that makes the games easier. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, I think I, I'm gonna make it to the end of the first level. If I can't make it to the end of the first level of Mega Man X, oh, you totally will. You're doing great. Then uh, I feel like one, my family will disown me. Okay. My Tempest playing mom and my my Super Nintendo game collecting brother will just stop uh, talking to me at family events, and uh, that would make me sad. So that I don't want that to happen. We do not want that to happen to you. Um, I thought it was interesting that there's no time rewind option like the classic Mega Man Legacy collection. Oh yeah, I hadn't I hadn't considered that. Um, let me get this. Here. Really fudge up. You can't just. You can't just flip it back. Yeah. Um, I know there's a power down there, but I'm gonna see if I can go through it out. You're doing it so much better than I did before the show started. <laughs> I like practice. There was so much swearing. It was adorable. I'm the worst. <laughs> I mean, I love them. I right. love them, and I will play them through to completion, even if it takes me dying hundreds of thousands of times to get all the boss patterns oh, no, down. No, no, no. Awesome. Yes. I like that mid-air grab. Yeah, I actually pulled out nice. something that looked kind of cool. That looked very cool. All right, now this gets a little tricky because I can't read the app. I can't remember where that's coming in. There was a time like I had all this stuff memorized, like it was my job. Right? I mean, it kind of was when we were kids. <laughs> right. Like I can't sit there and grind and train anymore. I know. That's I. I mean, I always feel horrible now that I have to take the time out of my gaming to do other real-world things. Yeah. Get that. Kill that guy. Get the pattern on those. And jump. And, oh, the car! Because once you have it memorized, then you can just, I mean, really speed run the best of them. But... Oh, yeah, on the car. Look at that oh. move. <laughs> I just ran myself over. <laughs> oh, interesting that the cars don't crash into each other. Yeah, the, the cars can, can flip. So, uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't think I've ever done that before, where I actually rode the car for a bit and then ran myself over. So uh, that was embarrassing. That's a masterful move. All right, here we go. All right. Let's see. Got a little under half-life. Come on, give me, oh, I was hoping you would give me a little help. But that's okay, because if I remember correctly, you can't beat the first level. You, you're gonna fight the guy that, that's, uh, that it becomes part of the story. Oh. The, uh, you're doomed to lose that first level? Yeah, the first fight. For story purposes. For dramatic effect. Yeah. So I, I can't wait to get you in on this though, because uh, let's see, let's see if I can even just put up a, a decent showing up against. You this can guy. do it. You can do it. Ah. Day. Okay, so he shoots and he charges. I can't get around. Oh yeah. Oh no, sir. And so okay, it looks like I mean, is hiding in the corner and acceptable defense? Well, because I think, dude? yeah, as soon as you Maybe get hit on by... on the left side, but not on the right? Yeah, as soon as you get hit by one of those, then the story oh, takes over. So, yeah, we, we, we can move on from there. Okay, great. You worthless piece of scrap All right, I'm going to take a stab at it. Do you, it's do you not going to be pretty. Do you want to stick with Mega Man X? We can get sure. through the story. Sure, no, yeah, okay. let's, let's just next level it. Um, I was doing a lot of smack on Twitter before the show went live today, uh, telling Juan I would school him in this. <laughs> this is, that's completely untrue and unfounded. I was like, we're going to do retro gaming, and you're like, oh, I'll have a chance of actually competing against Trisha for a change. <laughs> 
Well, if it was NES, <laughs> then I would feel like you would have no chance. I, however, I feel like that, that would have been more dangerous territory for me. Yeah, however, since we're in the 16-bit era here, you definitely have the advantage. I, I, I have a little bit more experience there, for sure. Oh man, I'm just skipping okay. past all this exposition. I, it's that was vital info that now will completely prevent you from from doing well. In any <laughs> oh, it's our save code. Whew. Thank goodness we Guys, can I always get back to <laughs> beating well, the first demo level. Of I was telling Juan before the show that uh, <laughs> when these save codes come up or when things come up in like puzzle games specifically, I still take out a notebook and start to write down. And then I'm like, I'm such a dummy, I can screenshot now. <laughs> what am I doing? doing or I even like, at one point took my phone and was like taking pictures of my screen, thinking I was like, oh, I'm being so modern. What? No. Come on, Trish. What That's are you hilarious. doing? That's hilarious. But what's so really funny, funny is, right? is I, I was in the same boat. Like, I still scribble notes because it's the immediacy of having something tactile. You know, like you can just scribble something out. I, I wouldn't have even have thought of using my phone camera. Ridiculous. Or something like that. Ridiculous. You, you spend 15 years playing NES and Super NES and stuff like that. Well, we had notebooks and pens. Like, I had an entire um, composition book that mapped out everything in Jurassic Park. Nice. Where all the dino eggs yep. were and how to get through all of the, the visitor center and stuff. And like, the notion now that I could just go like, Windows print screen. <laughs> I know. It's, it's hilarious. Crazy, man. No. No. Oh, you can't duck. You can't duck. You can't I know duck. it messes you with and your I head. And I can't shoot in different directions. You've got to jump. You, you've got a horizontal plane of destruction. Okay, Robo Bunny. Yeah, you don't want to yeah. mess with those bunnies. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to keep charged. If you, you need a holy hand grenade that? for those things. Is that things. a thing I can get? No, it doesn't look like this. Oh, oh man, you got to so look toast. out. Got to look I'm out. I'm so toast. I'm toast. I'm toast. I'm toast. You know what I think is kind of funny on these games for even the emulation is. God damn, run! Just run! <laughs> My you, way you got the bat. No, that was great. You <laughs> threw something I did not expect you to be able to survive that. Yeah. Um, no, what I think is yep. funny, and I was kind of disappointed in when I got my SNES Mini uh, Classic console thing, whatever it's called. Uh, you still have the the jank. If too many enemies end up on screen, the emulation still like chugs. Just like old consoles used to like slow down when they were too you many. You know, it's uh, for the nostalgia factor. Yeah, it's like, that's making it more authentic. Oh man, Leo's coming in Woo! with the game! I knew it was gonna happen! Ha 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 ha! Happy birthday, Juan! Yay, I would, I would sing to you, but I wouldn't oh, torture no. you like Cause, that. Cause, uh, no, I was gonna say, you've gotta focus on on uh, surviving, because you're doing pretty well. Also, I'm tone deaf, so that would be unfortunate for everyone if <laughs> Trisha tried to sing happy birthday. It's oh like man. A, oh! Like, especially monkey. for your husband being, you know, trained in the arts of musical theater. I know he's an amazing singer, and oh, I'm just the so worst. Good. I know. I, I like. It, 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 I can't go to a karaoke night with you guys if he leaves. Like, I can let him follow me. You know, our first couple gonna... leg predates were karaoke, and I think that had a lot to do with it. I'm not gonna lie. Oh, oh death! I'm dead. Death for me, I but that's all right. X2. We can sing to you. Uh, actually, here, let me wipe off the sweaty controller because I have gross sweaty gamer hands when I play platformers, so I'm just gonna hand that to you. Okay, I'm gonna go get a cake. Happy birthday, Juan. And it's a big cake, too, so it I'm, is a big I'm gonna cake. eat a lot of cake. Uh, since it's your it's birthday, if you wanna keep playing, I will wrap out the show. How okay, about that? cool. Okay, Here, great. You do that. Uh, so, uh, do you guys, oh, do you have any big plans for your birthday? Uh, actually, what I'm really excited about, again, mm -hmm. geeky, nerdy, sciencey stuff, is the dinosaur, Discovery Cube. A Discovery Cube! Yeah, I know, I just I'm saw gonna it go last week. Take, uh, take Lex and we're gonna go nerd out over some dinosaurs together. It's amazing. I have this really cute picture of Logan on a Jeep, like with some dino skeletons just exploring. Awesome. Yeah, super cute. Yeah, we're doing um, that. It's gonna be a good time. Go see animatronic dinosaurs. Yes. Uh, so remember, everyone who's watching out there, uh, you guys can always shop on newegg.com slash newegnow through the end of the day today while supplies last. You get all the great deals that we talked about during the show and even more that we haven't got to because we never get to them all in a show. You can save $30 on a new Samsung TV, $50 on a TMAC gaming headset from Razer, or $100 on an HP Omen gaming monitor. Um, again, it's all while supplies last through the end of the day, only as a part of Newegg now. Um, get it. Get, get it. What are you fighting right now? Um, I just blew that guy up. He was in my way. Perfect. So he died. Uh, so thanks again to James from AMD for being part of the show today. And remember to check out Threadripper Second Gen yeah. on Newegg.com to pick up one of those crazy powerful new CPUs for yourself. 
So thanks to all of you out there for watching. Make sure to tune into the show next week when we'll be talking all about laptops, drones, and lightweight tech. Woo. This is the new egg now. <laughs>